go to. Ni hao. Assalamu alaikum. And welcome. Tonight is a moment in time, a unique opportunity to bring this community together. I believe that most people are good people and want to live in harmony with their neighbors. I am not here to run down Pukekohe, to pull down statues or to rename streets. Neither am I here to apportion blame, to demonize your ancestors, or to take you on a colonial guilt trip. I am here to offer constructive advice as an outsider. I have listened carefully to many residents on how to view the history of this town. And I want to begin with a story. When I first started teaching 20 years ago, I worked in a school in a small town in the state of Vermont. And there was a teacher there who at the time I called the worst teacher I had ever met. He had it planned, he'd been at the school for so many years, he had it planned so we didn't have to come in until period two. And often, when the period two bell would ring, he would just be pulling into the school. And he could hear the bell, he'd get out of his car, and he'd very slowly walk into the building while the teachers were scrambling around, trying to cover his classes. And I just remember thinking, this guy is dead wood, he shouldn't be teaching anymore, and often during the day, I'd see him taking breaks. He wasn't uh, helping students when he really should have been helping students. And one day, after about six months, this guy had a room right next to mine. I said to one of the teachers, I said, that guy is the worst teacher I've ever met. And he goes, you don't know about John. And I said, well, what about John? He said, well, John taught here for many years. He's an English teacher. And about a year and a half ago, he was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And he doesn't have long to live. But he wants to do something in the time that he has left. So, as best he could, he would come into the school. He could not run because he had an operation and it affected his walking and his life. And John never seemed to get upset over anything. And I just thought to myself how stupid I was, how clueless I was. Here's a guy for six months. His room was right next to mine, and I didn't have a clue. Now, the other day, I gave a talk at a local school, and toward the end, a Maori woman became quite emotional because her family was part of the story I was talking about. And she said that she could recall as a child her parents stopping at the bus depot in Pukekohe because that was the only place at the time where they were allowed to use the toilet on the main street. At the time, there was a mall Republic toilet, but it was all the way across the bridge where the Mad Butcher is today. And when she told that story, some of the audience members had this look on their face like, really? That happened here? I'm willing to bet you right now there are people sitting in the audience who don't know that that happened or think that that never happened. And that's what I'm here to talk about tonight, separating fact from fiction. And it reminds me, when I saw what was going on in Pukekohe, what happened in 1985 in America. They had the O.J. Simpson trial. And when they announced that trial, they had many pictures of people in school at the time. This is at university. This is a white person reaction. When I say white, how light do you have to be to be white? How dark do you have to be to be black? It's just melanin in your skin. 
These are some other students reacting to the O.J. Simpson verdict of innocence. Here are some African Americans and their reaction. And here is a university with students who had gone to school together for many years, sharing the same classrooms, going out together, when the verdict was read. Look at those European students at the front. And then the African American students. Why are they reacting that way? I think the European students didn't have a clue the extent of the discrimination that was felt by the African American students and people. And I think something like that has happened here in Pukekohe. It has to do with, take a close look at that picture, the selective nature of perception, confirmation bias. People tend to seek out information that reinforces their pre-existing world view. By the way, that photo right there is from the Heritage Collection, and it was logged many years ago. One of the categories it was logged under was cultural diversity. I don't think it would be logged under that today. The Franklin Historical Society recently offered me some advice that dwelling on past wrongs is not a basis for harmony today. The problem is, ignoring past wrongs is not a recipe for harmony either. You cannot choose your relatives, and you cannot choose your history, but you have to live with both of them. You can't censor history, because to do so is to silence the voice of Valerie residents and their ancestors. Some people see me as further dividing this community by focusing on the negative. The problem is, that negative is somebody else's history. And they have a right to know the history of their own town, of their own people, and in many cases, their own families. You cannot change the past and you cannot censor it, but you can control the present. Pukekohe does not have to be defined by its past, but it will be defined by how it handles that past. Over the last 15 months, I have received about 1,800 online messages about my book. Most are supportive. Some are deeply hurtful and offensive. My message to those people, if you are here tonight, is welcome. Some may hate you, but those who hate you never win, unless you hate them back. One of the labels for Pukekohe, like it or not, is that it's racist. This view is alive and well online. It was there long before my books ever came out. The best way to counter that narrative is to acknowledge the past. Talk about it. Teach it. Heed the lessons that it learns. Salem, Massachusetts is where they had the witch trials. They commemorate that event every year. They teach it in their schools. And in doing so, they highlight the need for tolerance, diversity, and inclusion today. When I think of Salem, that's what I think of. When I see someone from Germany, I don't think Nazi. When I see somebody from Japan, I don't think kamikaze pilot. And when I see someone from Pukekohe, I don't think racist. But some people do. 
The key is how you teach it. Don't make it personal and give the historical context. Those who engaged in the segregation were products of their time. If you do that, it will make your community stronger. The idea that we should not dwell on the past will not work. The problem is that very little has been written on the segregation. That's not dwelling on the past. That's raising awareness of your history, a history that you have a right to know. It is the job of historians to dwell on the past, to learn lessons so we can learn from those mistakes. That's why we teach history. What if I attended a Gallipoli commemoration and held up a placard that said, we need to stop dwelling on the past? Many Balri feel the same way. The reason you don't want to dwell in the past is because it's a past that you don't like. But historians don't get to pick and choose what to teach just because you don't like what happened. To ignore or downplay what happened is an attempt by the winners to rewrite history. I wrote my book from the perspective of the losers, people who lost their ancestral lands, lost their wealth, lost their education, and lost their dignity and ended up working on those same lands as second-class citizens. The Franklin Historical Society shared with me their vision on how schools should teach history. They believe that facts are more important than opinions and prejudices, and they want lessons that are grounded in facts, not myths. I wholeheartedly agree. If they truly believe this, I challenge them to speak out on the baseless, crazy claims promoted in the Pukekohe e-local magazine <laughs> and on social media, claims like Maury did not settle New Zealand, that there was a race of white-skinned people here first, that Maury ate most of the men, made sex slaves out of the women, and that their skeletons are being hidden by the government, archaeologists, and Maori leaders in a grand conspiracy. There are people out here who actually believe this. This is exactly why we need to teach history in our schools, so our children don't get their facts from social media and partisan pseudo-news outlets. Many Maori have told me that they cannot put what happened behind them and move forward until there is an acknowledgement of what took place, that it's too painful. And they hear people saying that it didn't happen, or downplaying it, or that we shouldn't dwell in the past. And they feel hurt and angry, because part of that past includes the deaths of hundreds of infants and children that need not have happened, and I'll address that shortly. Tonight is an opportunity to move forward, to rewrite the script, to turn the page to a new chapter. But there's another script out there, one that says we shouldn't teach our history. Fear is writing that script. There's an old saying, if you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got. The best way to demonstrate that Pukekohe is not racist is to rebrand this town as the home of diversity, tolerance, inclusion. You do this through deeds. By teaching lessons from the segregation era, you demonstrate your commitment to those values. Folks, the solution is not going to be revolutionary. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to have to be evolutionary. It's going to happen 
in our schools from kindergarten on up in teaching what happened. Pukakoi, you don't have to be defined by your past, but you will be defined by how you address that past. Now, after my recent talk at the Pukakoi Library, people made comments like, that's your opinion. Some are trying to frame the debate over what happened in Pukakoi as some kind of contested history, that it's somehow open to debate. Make no mistake, it is not. The facts are clear. I study claims of the supernatural. I've investigated the conjuring. I've investigated the Amityville horror. I don't believe in any of them. People ask me, do you believe? And I say, it's not a matter of belief. It's a matter of evidence in what you can prove. So, let's examine the facts. Claim number one, barbers refused to cut Maori hair. This claim has always been that it was not based on race, but hygiene, as they were garden workers without adequate bathing facilities. This does not account for why barbers would not cut Indian hair. I have interviewed Indian residents who told me the reason given was their skin color. There were also barbers who refused to cut Chinese hair. Hygiene was the excuse. As for women, for the longest time, no hairdresser would cut Maori hair. At one point, a hairdresser in Pukakoi had a notice in the window that said, we don't cut brown skin hair. I'm not making that up. That's based on interviews with Maori elders at the local Marae on April 14th of 2013 with journalist Michael Pator, who incidentally used to work for the Pukakoi Elo. Claim number two, segregation at the cinema was based on hygiene. Maori were barred from the upstairs of the Strand from at least 1933 to 1962. And I'll give you one example. In 1949, the headmaster at Pukakoi High School, Danny Bryant, took the first 15 rugby team to the cinema as a reward for winning a game. As they went upstairs, the owner said the two Maori players had to sit downstairs. After an argument, the entire team sat downstairs to be with their Maori teammates. I see that as uplifting. In September of 1962, the owner of the Strand, Brian Blennerhassett, told Maori Affairs Minister Ralph Hainan that he would stop the practice after Hainan literally begged him in a series of letters to stop as it was making New Zealand look bad in the international press. The key question is, why were they banned from the upstairs? In a letter to Maori Affairs Minister in August 1962, Mr. Blennerhassett made it clear it was because of the, quote, filthy, unhygienic, and vandal performing majority of Maori. So the ban was not just based on hygiene, it was a racial stereotype. In 1950, there was a charge of racism against the Strand, and the mayor defended it by saying that Hindus and Chinese were also subject to the same restrictions due to dirt and behavior. That is why, like Maori, they were forced to sit in the cheapest seats. There was a clear racial element. These were blanket stereotypes of entire groups of people. Claim number three. Maori were barred from drinking alcohol in Pukakoi due to hygiene. There are numerous accounts in the government files and press reports that went on for decades. Two quick examples. Kiwi writer James Edwards, in his book, A Long White Cloud, on page 35, writes, in 1952, I visited the Pukakoi Hotel one afternoon. I discovered there were only Maoris drinking in that particular bar. 
I asked one of them for the reason. He shrugged his shoulders and said, it's been like this for a long time. This is the only bar we're allowed to drink in, unquote. In April of 1957, an Auckland police inspector reported that a hotel in Pukekohe was refusing to allow Maori women inside their premises. He said that the women were being forced to sit on the ground behind the building, and then the alcohol was brought out to them. A lawyer for the hotel said that the practice had been going on for a long time. That bar was later segregated in 1960. If it was based just on hygiene, why were there reports of Indian and Chinese residents being refused alcohol into the early 1960s? There was a clear racial element. Again, a blanket view of an entire group of people. Claim number four, Princess Tapoya approached the government to build a native school, and that's how the Pukekohe Maori-only school came into being in 1952. That's taken from a local school website. This claim is almost certainly a myth. There is nothing on this in the National Archives, in the files of the native school, or the local archives on Pukekohe, or the newspaper archives. I've contacted some of the top historians in the country, people who specialize in native schools. They've never heard of it. I've reached out to the Franklin Historical Society and the Pukekohe Hill School with a source and date, and no one has found one. And you won't find one, because based on the archives, it can't be true. Because here's the real reason why the native school was built. Pakia parents did not want their children going to school with an inferior race. In December 1937, four different government ministries sent high-ranking officials to Pukekohe to see for themselves what was going on. They reported that the days they visited, there wasn't a single Maori attending the school, even though they were on the rolls. Most were working in the market gardens quite illegally. So the federal government stepped in, read the riot act to school officials, the market gardeners, and the police, and all of a sudden, within months, there are news reports of Pakia residents urging the creation of a native school in 1938. Which leads me to the other claim about the school. that Pakia parents wanted it to help Maori learn about their own culture and basic hygiene. That wasn't the main reason. The archives tell a very different story. The school in question was not just a native school, but a special native school with just natives. That's different than the many other public native schools across the country. It was to be racially segregated. In 1943, an education inspector wrote that the push for segregation in Pukekohe, quote, has come from the Pakia and not from the Maoris, unquote. And when he called for a meeting of interested Maori parents, there was no interest. And I mean no interest. No one showed up. The education ministry then suggested that the school address their hygiene concerns with a bathhouse. The school's response, a bathhouse won't solve the problem because, quote, the needs and problems are more far-reaching than cleanliness. If there is any doubt as to why the native school was built, on May 30th and November 15th of 1945, two separate government memos summed up the reasons why Pakia wanted a native school. Now, I left some of this out of my book. People say I'm trying to sensationalize. I didn't put it in. But I'm going to tell you now what I didn't put in. Quote, it is alleged that the Pukekohe Maoris are an ill-assorted section of people. Quote, Europeans resented the presence of Maori children at the school. Another reason they didn't want their kids in the same school was the belief that and I quote, the majority of the Maori children were seriously retarded, unquote. 
Now, why do people think that? Because in 1945, they were taught in school that they were superior and inferior races. So I understand that. And I forgive those people myself for that belief, because that's what people taught, and that's what people believed. When the school was up and running in 1952, there was a push to make sure that all Maori students went to the native school. They couldn't legally stop it, but they tried. This is summed up in a story by the Reverend Des Jones in 1953. He said that Maori parents were routinely told that they must enroll their children in the native school. When the mother of a new Maori family in his congregation took her children to enroll, he said, quote, she was told to go to the Maori school where her children could be enrolled. She insisted they be enrolled in the non-Maori school. Again, the response, sorry, you'll have to take them to the Maori school. After ringing the education ministry without success, she contacted her MP, Jack Massey, who told her that the Maori school would meet her needs better. The woman never gave up, kept pestering the principal, and eventually he relented. Now once the school got up and running, there was a push in the press and in the Maori community to support the school. And of course you're going to support your own people and your own culture. And that's what happened. The school was plagued by extremely high absenteeism rates. By the early 1960s, support for the Maori-only school collapsed among Maori. They left in droves. The pepper potting housing scheme was kicking in, and by 1964, it was over. When people claim today that Pakia wanted a native school so Maori could learn about their culture, the view of Maori culture back then was poor, and it's not much better today. Just eight days ago, I received a letter from a local historian who wrote that many Maori embraced the European culture as it was an escape from the tribal society that was based on fear, bondage, and revenge. If that's the belief today, what was it back then? Segregated toilets. Many people have come up to me and said, you've got the story wrong. There were never segregated toilets. In November of 1945, a senior education officer inspected the main Pukekohe school, and he wrote, and I quote, separate laboratories have been set aside for Maoris, and they use the swimming bath only on the last day of the week before the water is renewed, unquote. A number of Maori who I interviewed confirmed that the school had separate toilets. There were no signs, there was a hall monitor who would enforce it. Now maybe some people went to another school or got that story mixed up. I was not there. All I could do was talk to people who were there and look at the records. I do know that in 1951, Clive Sage of Auckland University College lived in Pukekohe and he wrote a thesis on the transition between the old school and the new school. And he wrote that before the new school opened, quote, no Maori plays for a Pakia team, nor does any Maori swim in the public baths or play tennis on the Pakia courts, or even on the public school courts out of school hours, in part because they didn't want them using the public toilets. In 1937, Four government officials visited Pukekohe and reported back that not a single business in town would let Maori use their public toilets. In an effort to stop them from quote-unquote pestering local businesses, a Maori toilet was built in 1938. Those people were Mr. Alfrey, the Public Works Department, Mr. Tianga of the Native Department, Dr. Hughes of the Health Department, and Dr. A.W. Scanlon of the Labor Department. I don't know how long it lasted, but I can tell you this. In 1950, Mayor Max Grierson cautioned a New Zealand Herald reporter 
about doing too much too soon for Maori, like letting them use the public toilets. That's in the New Zealand Herald, October 16, 1950, page 6. The deaths from 1925 to 1961. Hundreds of Maori infants and children died in Pukekohe from preventable diseases directly linked to their atrocious housing. Measles, diphtheria, whooping cough, tuberculosis. In 1938 alone, in a relatively small community in New Zealand, Pukekohe, with no more than a few hundred Maori living here, 30 Maori died that year. 29 of them were infants and children aged 14 and under. It is heartbreaking going through the Pukekohe Maori Death Register. It cost me $50 in about four months to apply to be able to look at that. I'm not allowed to show you photos. Anybody can apply to look at this document at the Auckland National Archives. And you know, when I was doing this book, I thought to myself when I saw that, you know, you see the different years, three, four, seven, nine, nine different years of preventable diseases because of the housing. And I just thought to myself, how come people don't know this story? And that it should be up there with other things we teach in school, like Gallipoli, Passchendaele, the Dawn Raids, Bastion Point, Ihumata, Erebus, Surafint, Featherston, but people are unaware of it. I want to talk a little bit about some of the descriptions. This is the health inspector in 1925. This is from the Franklin Times. Overcrowded shacks with no toilets or running water. The buildings are erected of old timber, old battered corrugated iron sacking, benzene tins and cases, no floors, they are not weatherproof, and they have no proper means of ventilation and lighting. It's chilly tonight. But it's not raining. But I wouldn't want to be in one of those buildings on a chilly, windy evening. 1931. Auckland Star. In a shed 8 feet by 10 feet, built of kerosene cases and roofed with kerosene tins. In a market garden, Maoris were living. One health board official described no fewer than eight persons huddled into this shelter, and a few days ago, a baby was born there. There is no floor. In 1944, the New Zealand Herald described a two-room shack where 12 people were living. Nineteen fifty, a Maori woman had just returned from digging potatoes. This is from the Auckland Star. Her feet were bare and covered with mud. Her clothes were torn and filthy. The hut, little more than a lean-to shack, without water, stove, 
lighting, or toilet facilities. She lives there with her husband and four children. She used to have eight children, but four of them died in the past few years from malnutrition and tuberculosis. Nineteen sixty one. Hidden on a back road of Pukakoe, this is from a nurse named Leslie Smith. The shack was of corrugated iron with two small rooms. In one room, an open lean to fireplace provided the only means for cooking. A sofa and makeshift table were the only furniture. Two beds occupied all of the floor space in the second room. The floor was of dirt. Small holes in the tin roof suggested ineffectual protection from rain and wind. The only facility of any kind was a tap some distance. A distressed, coughing baby lay on an old sofa. Two small children stood nearby. Their mother stood with slumped shoulders and lowered head in an attitude which spoke of long-standing defeat. The family were Malray. So in 1961, this family was living in a corrugated iron shack, two rooms, exposed to the elements, with no water or toilet, and a dirt floor. These shacks were death traps for disease. That these poor, landless Maori were allowed to live under these conditions over so many decades is the heart of this story. That something happened in 1925 and people are living in a shack with stacked up benzene cans, okay. But in 1961, 25, 35, 45, 55, into the early 1960s. And instead of helping them, they were segregated. History is open to interpretation. But in this case, what happened is clear. Whether it was a description of the housing from 1925 or 1961, little had changed because the life of a Maori child was worth less than that of a Pakia. If those had been little European girls and boys living under those same conditions and dying in such numbers, something would have been done. Instead of helping, they tried to segregate them out of fear because they were the other. They were the children of an inferior race. So when people say we should not dwell on our history, I understand why our Maori brothers and sisters have a hard time getting past it. It is essential to teach this history. We owe it to those children. We owe it to those families. And just as importantly, that history informs the present and why Maori have had such a struggle. They lost their land and ended up working as menial laborers on their ancestral lands as outcasts with little economic power and levels of education. You don't recover from something like that in a generation. Now I want to make a mention of the local media. The local media needs to do better. Three weeks ago, I gave a talk in front of 120 people at the Pukakoe Library on the history of racial segregation. I've written two books on it. I am not aware of a single story written on that in the local media. Why? Because of fear. You know there's a problem in a community when a reporter expresses interest in writing a book with me on the segregation and the local paper tells him, if you do, you'll have to use a fake name. And that's exactly what happened. People ask me why Maury didn't stand up. They couldn't, because if you did, you potentially lost your slum housing, the only housing that they had. Now, this is a picture from 1950, from one of the papers. One of the elders is here tonight, told me that around that time, 
they had a picture taken in front of one of their shacks on the market gardens and the owner of the shack was upset because it was in the newspaper. So they kicked him out of their shack as retribution. Of course, they didn't leave and if the police came and stuff, it may have gotten in the paper, so they stayed, they refused to go. Now look, I'm not just picking on Pukekohe. There was segregation that happened around the country. It happened in different pockets around the country. In Hamilton, stores in about 1960 refused to let Maul retry on pants. We know that because there was a Hawaiian student from America that came over here, was living in Hamilton, and he filed a complaint. Now, when people say there's not a lot of discrimination against Maori, or it's, it, it's been pretty good for quite a while, it reminds me of the Hakka Party incident at Auckland University. And for years and years, from the mid-30s to at least 1979, people would dress up at Auckland University, the engineering students, and they would make fun of Maori culture. It was capping day, graduation, and they would do this in the streets. This went on for decades. And when my book came out, I had that previous picture, and somebody wrote in and they said, oh, that's not true. We respected Maori culture back then. It was just a group of jokers from the engineering department, and um, it's just not true. Odahuhu, 1969. And then, of course, you had the confrontation at Auckland University in 1979. There's now a play at Auckland University about this, where they were practicing for their haka party, and a fistfight broke out. People couldn't control themselves. They were so emotional about what happened. In the paper, this is how it was described in the Southland Times. A light the light-hearted antics of a group of Auckland University students should not be interpreted as ridiculing the culture of the Maori people. That doesn't age well. On the right there is a male student dressed up as a female with black face and holding a gollywog down. So that's Auckland University students. In 1923, they were dressed up as Ku Klux Klan members to promote a play. Were they members of the Klan? I don't know. But I do know this, that the Ku Klux Klan was responsible for the deaths of thousands of people through lynchings, and it certainly was insensitive that that didn't bat an eye back then, shows you the extent of racial insensitivity at the time. That's New Zealand television. Blackface is offensive because there used to be menstrual plays in the United States in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, where white people would put black on their face and basically act silly and stupid, uh, making fun of Native American or African American slaves. And you know, I just want to highlight the fact that I'm a New Zealand citizen and I feel very lucky. I think this is a wonderful country. I don't want people to think I'm coming here to Pukekohe to trash the place. It is a beautiful place. It really is. And the people I have met are really nice people. But I have philosophical differences with some of them. Now, I want to make some final comments. And that is, today, Maori are no longer refused haircuts, or segregated in the cinema, or denied service in bars, 
or the use of public toilets. But if you listen carefully to the voices of your Maori brothers and sisters, they will tell you that it's still happening. It's only taking a different form. It's the Natai Tama Oho elder who stood in front of the Pukakoi Library not long ago with her son and other Maori boys and they were shooed away by a local woman because one of them was bouncing very passively a basketball. And when the elder realized that a group of Pakia boys were doing the same thing nearby and nothing was said to them, she told the Maori boys to hold their ground. The woman then called the police, and they came. I was saying before this talk this evening uh, to Honey and Newton that I went out to Ihumata last year, and when I came back, I met a senior history teacher at a major school in Auckland who'd been there for many years. And she said, you went out to Ihumata? I said, yeah, it was exciting. She goes, why would you waste your time going out there? Why don't they get a job? I was stunned by those comments. This is somebody who should know, who's taught history for 25 years and who's teaching history to our children. That's why we need history to be taught in our schools and taught fact-based history. It's also the granddaughter of a local elder who promised her that she would take Maori in school, only to come home one day speaking French. And when asked why, was told, my teacher said that Maori won't get me very far, but French will. It's the Maori girl who applied to attend an area school and put down that she aspired to be a veterinarian only to be told that it was probably beyond her and that she should be more realistic. Listen to the voices of your Maori brothers and sisters. Their stories, their voices are far more powerful than anything I could ever say. Every country has a history of intolerance, whether it's the Dawn Raids, the Chinese gold miners, the Dalmatians, or the rise of the White New Zealand League. As tragic and as painful these memories are to relive, these are powerful histories that teach us valuable lessons because they remind us of the necessity for tolerance, diversity, and inclusion today. We cannot change the past but we can change the path that we are on. No one's blaming you. No one's blaming your ancestors. They were products of their time. But this is a different time. We now know that race is a myth, but it's a social reality. Together as a community, with our schools, we can rewrite that script. The racial segregation in Pukekohe will be taught in the new curriculum. It's being taught right now in many of our schools. There are 1,800 copies of the book out there. Students are going to choose it as a topic of research. When they Google Pukekohe, what will they find? A town divided and in denial, trapped by its past, or a town that is listening to the voices of their Maori brothers and sisters having robust discussions about what happened and the importance of tolerance and inclusion and moving forward together? The wheels of progress turn slowly, but they turn. The script is yet to be written. That script will be written by you here this evening. Thank you very much.